This is the first in a series of lectures on algebra for students of MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In these lectures will gradually work through more abstract algebraic structures, but we'll start off with basic arithmetic. So we're going to start by thinking about division of integers. So um, one of the most obvious facts in arithmetic is that if we try and divide 2 by 3, we get an a, a two thirds not an integer, even though two and three are integers, two thirds is not. So we have to sort of make do with not being able to divide cleanly one thing by another. And so we'll instead have to deal with dividing with remainder. Um, and that's going to be our focus in this lecture. So the first observation we want to make is that, uh, so I'll make a proposition, um, if b and c are integers, um, and if a b divides c, then um, that implies that uh, either um, the absolute value of b is less than that of c, or um, b is c, or b is minus c. So we want to prove this. Um, so uh, our proof, um, the first obvious remark is that it's good enough to assume that, uh, um, so it's good enough to assume that uh, B and C are both positive. Um, in, in fact, you could deal with, well, you can work out the cases of one or the other being zero. And if they're uh, negative, if they're both negative, say, uh, for example, then you can change the signs of both of them. And that doesn't change the divisibility relationship. And it doesn't change this statement either. So it's good enough to just worry about the positive case. And I'll leave you to worry about the details of other cases. So um, suppose that, that we're wrong about this. Suppose that somehow um, that, uh, that B is, is positive and bigger than C, suppose. So we can write B as C plus K, where K is some integer, which is positive. B, C, and K are all positive. So B divides C, so uh, divides C. So um, so C has to be some multiple of B. Q is, of course, our quotient. And again, Q is an integer. Uh, just write int for integer. Um, and uh, since C and B are positive, Q has to be positive. And um, so if Q is 1, then B is C, and we're done. But Q is positive, and it's not 1 then Q has to be something plus 1, some n uh, positive integer. If it's not equal to 1 and it's positive, then it's bigger by, by 1 than somebody else. And so we can write down that C is Q times B, which is n plus 1 times B. Um, uh, but we already know that. So that's n plus 1 times, well, B we said was C plus a positive. So that gives us... Um, nc plus nk plus c um, uh, plus uh, c plus k. So um, so what we can see then is that um, we've got a c on this side and a c on that side. So we can cancel. We get 0 is nc plus nk plus k. But those are all positive, and that's a contradiction. Um, so that's the sort of thing we should be able to do in this class. We need to be able to prove very simple statements about basic properties of the integers. In the lecture notes, you'll find that there are extensive uh, there's extensive discussion of the basic properties of the integers from which we can derive all of our proofs. But I won't go into that in detail in the, in the lectures. And the next step we want to take is to think about division um, in cases where there are remainders, where things don't divide in neatly. Um, so we'll uh, write down a theorem, which is due to Euclid. that uh, if b, c, and c again are integers, uh, and c, well, suppose it's not 0. We can worry about the 0 case on your own. Um, what happens then? OK, then uh, there is a, there's a unique um, integer uh, q and unique integer r. I should also say it's unique, um, so that uh, B 
is quotient times C plus remainder. Um, and uh, with the remainder having to be maybe zero, uh, but not as large as C in absolute value. Okay, so that's Euclid's theorem. So it means we can divide with a remainder, right? Um, and the, the proof that that can always be done. Um, we can uh, we can always change signs um, uh, if we need to, and I'll let you worry about what to do, how to deal with that. Um, uh, so that we can arrange, um, we won't worry about actually about B so much, but just to, just C, so we can arrange that C is positive. And I'll let you worry again about what if C is negative, how, does the, how do we deal with the, the details of the sign change? You'd have to change the sign of Q, I should say B, it should be, it should be Q. You change the sign of Q and C together to make it work if, they're, um, if C is negative. So we won't worry about that, I'll leave you to fill in the details. Um, so how do we now deal with the case where when C is positive? Um, so we consider um, uh, consider the set of all integers which are of the form B minus QC, where uh, any where we can pick any integer Q. Um, all the, in the integers can, can somehow be expressed in this form for any integer q. Um, so uh, if uh, we were to choose q, for example, to be minus the absolute value of b, b minus qc would be b minus minus absolute b c. Um, and that gives me uh, b plus absolute value b times C, which is B plus absolute value B plus absolute value B times C minus 1. And we're assuming that C is positive, and so this guy is greater than or equal to 0, that's positive, that's, well, and this together is greater than, uh, greater than 0, uh, greater than or equal to 0. So, um, so the whole thing uh, put together is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so what we've established is among all the integers that have this form, if we in particular pick q to be this particular integer, then the this integer is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so inside our set, so our set, our set contains uh, some integer greater than or equal to zero. The set of all integers that this form has, when you put q in like that, it has something greater than or equal to zero in it. So we've established that there is um, an integer of that form, which is greater than or equal to 0. Um, so there is an integer of the form b minus qc, which is greater than or equal to 0. There is one, and uh, so let's choose the smallest. And so by the principle of well-ordering, there is a smallest such one and call it R is B minus QC. So we now have established, if we just add the QC to the other side, that B is QC plus R, so that's the property we needed. And we've also established that it's an integer greater than or equal to zero, so R is greater than or equal to zero. But we still need to show that we can arrange somehow that R is less than the absolute value of C. That's That we haven't got worked out yet. So what happens if that doesn't happen? Well, if R is bigger than or equal to uh, C, we've, remember we've now arranged that C is positive, um, we could pull out a, um, a C, a copy of C from R, and we add, and then add 1 to Q, and we still get the same equation. We still get this equation satisfied as long as if we were to take a C out here and put one in here, in other words, put a one into the Q, we'd get the same equation satisfied. So, uh, so we could make a smaller R. So if we did that, we get a smaller R. Um, and so, but that's a contradiction because we assumed we took the smallest R. And so there can't, there can't be such a, such a, a copy we could pull out. So this can't have happened. So R is less than C. Um, okay, so that's the complete proof. Oh, but that, that only proves, sorry, it's not a complete proof. It didn't prove the uniqueness. We've proved that there exists such an R, 
and we still need to prove it's unique. So suppose that you have a Q and an R, and I have a different Q and an R. Um, then uh, the question is whether they're the same. Um, so you have uh, this guy, and I have the same equation satisfied, but with capital letters instead of the little letters. Then what happens? Um, so let's take a look at it. Um, we've got we've got B is um, QC plus R, but that's the same as QC plus R. Uh, your choices and my choices, and we want to make sure that they're the same. So what we'll do is just to um, to take the difference between the two. The difference between the two is uh, is going to be zero. So zero is um, this minus this times C plus this minus this. Okay, so um, so these are, are, are the quantities we're dealing with. Now let's suppose we can assume, um, just for, for simplicity, we can assume uh, if, if, if my remainder is smaller than yours, we can swap them. So let's assume that my remainder is bigger. Um, then um, uh, then we have to make sure that, that somehow these are, these are forced to be the same. Um, so we get, therefore, that uh, 0 is less than to R little r is less than or equal to big R, which is less than C. And so 0 is less than or equal to big R minus little r, which is less than C. Um, uh, but C, uh, we can see from this equation, divides this guy, and it divides that guy. So it's to divide that guy. C divides here. You can see the C in it. It divides 0, because everything divides 0. So it has to divide into there. C divides uh, r minus r. Um, but it r minus r is smaller, uh, so that uh, forces r to equal little, little r. And then once you plug that back in here, you get, therefore, that q equals little q. So you have existence and uniqueness of the um, of these guys. Now, that's not the only way to do the argument. Of course, there's another obvious argument uh, about uh, little r being the smallest possible choice, so big r has to be no smaller, but then vice versa has to be no bigger. So that'd be another way to do the argument. Now that's very theoretical, but of course practically, how do you do these things? Well, you already know how to how to calculate quotients and remainders by uh, long division. So uh, so to find the Q and the R, you use long division. And I'm not going to go into long division at all um, for two reasons. One that you already know it pretty well how to lo do long division of integers. Um, and the other is a uh, surprising fact that long division is done very differently in different countries with different uh, notation. So um, I don't want to have to get into that <laughs> issue. Uh, so I won't do any long divisions in front of you. Um, there are some done in the book, but they're done in a particular notation. Uh, and that may not be the notation that you learned when you were in secondary school. So if we have b is 249, c is 17, how do we divide one into the other? We do some kind of long division, which might look something like this. Uh, it turns out it goes in 14 times. There are some steps, which, I, again, I'm not going to write out for you. There are some way to do the steps. And when, you, when you're done, you get a remainder of 11. Uh, we can write that out as saying 249, the b, is a quotient of 14 times uh, a number 17 plus a remainder of 11. Um, so there's also yet another problem about different nationalities, different choices of notation. I'm using this for multiplication. I'll, I'll multiply things either by writing them beside each other if they're abstract symbols like A or B, but if they're if they're uh, integers, then the other possibility is that I'll write them as um, with a dot in the middle for multiplication. You might prefer a little cross, um, uh, but that's which is fine. Um, or some other no system of notation. Some people use the dot for, of course, for a decimal place. Um, so it's a bit confusing. I tend to write my decimals something like uh, uh, like this, uh, with a thin, thin space in here between uh, every three digits. But you may prefer to put a comma in there, and that's fine too. Um, there are going to be a lot of those little issues about how we, what sort of notation we prefer. And that's why I don't want to get into long division at all, because it, it might be confusing if I do it the way that I was taught to do it and not the way that you were taught to do it, since there are students from many different nationalities in our class. So now we want to think about how we can use these, um, these ideas of quotient remainder to study not just one integer, but a whole bunch of them. Uh, we'll start off with thinking about greatest common uh, divisors 
Um, it's tricky though. The word greatest is also sometimes uh, written as highest. So it could be a greatest common divisor or a highest common divisor. And divisor is sometimes described as factor. So there's no standard for this. Some people prefer saying highest common factor, which I think is the standard in um, higher secondary schools. And uh, But greatest common factor, highest common d divisor, all those possibilities are out there. I'll always say greatest common divisor, and so I'll always write it as GCD, but you may prefer HCF or HCD or some other combination of those letters. Um, uh, that's fine. So uh, given a set of integers, a set of integers, so I don't just want to have a greatest common divisor for in, a pair of integers, but for any set of integers, um, a common divisor, is an integer that divides divides all integers in the set. Okay, so that's a common divisor. A greatest common divisor, unfortunately, it's not a great name because it doesn't really have anything about being greatest in, in the definition. A greatest common divisor, a GCD, um, is uh, a common divisor that has the universal property that um, you know, that's what's greater than or equal to zero, uh, into which all other others, all other common divisors divide. Okay, so that's a greatest common divisor, and um, and as an exercise for you to try to see if you can do this stuff, uh, there exists a unique. That's the exists sign. That's the unique sign. Uh, there exists a unique, maybe I should just write it out, there exists a unique, um, unique GCD of any set of integers. So if you pick a set of integers, it always has a GCD, there's a unique one, including the empty set has a, has a GCD. We need to come up with a method to find these things, not just know that they exist, so I'll leave you to prove the existence and uniqueness of the GCD of a set of integers. But how do we find it if we wanted to actually calculate? This is how we do it, to make it very quick. Um, the following lemma. Lemma means a little tiny theorem, um, a baby theorem. Given b and c integers, um, with c, say, not 0, um, it, what we can do is we can always compute uh, the quotient and remainder by long division. So in other words, b is qc plus r, let's say. And um, then the GCD of B and C is the GCD of C and R. Okay, so why is this true? Um, the proof is simply that um, if you were to take the uh, divisor, any divisor of C and R, then um, it would also be a divisor of um, B equals QC plus R, because it divides into C and R, it divides into the C here and the R here, so it divides into that sum. Uh, and then um, you could uh, go back the other way, that if you had it, so it would be, uh, we would divisor therefore of B and C. And if you go back the other way, you could say if it's a divisor of B and C, so that's how we go this way. If we go the other way, really you could write B equals QC plus R as R equals um, B minus QC. So if D divides B and C, it divides R, and then it goes up here and divides that. So it has the same, they have the same divisors, and therefore the same greatest common divisor. Okay, let's see what that looks like when we try to actually calculate greatest common divisors. It makes it pretty quick, um, because the numbers get small uh, very quickly. If we take B is um, 249, and C is 17, then we know the remainder is 11. So, um, uh, which I won't, I won't worry about checking for you. Again, you can do the long division. So we start off with 249, and then we and 17. We write the two numbers down. Whose whose who's greatest common divisor we want to find? If we're, we'll just worry about two numbers. Suppose we have these two numbers. We want to find the greatest common divisor. Divide the the last one to the next to last one. Divide that one to that one, and write the remainder down. Then divide that one to that one, and write the remainder down. And then divide that one into that one, and write the remainder down and then divide that one into that one and write the remainder down. 
and um, and that's how we can very quickly find the GCD. The GCD is the last non-zero number. Um, how do I know that? Well, because after that they divide into each other um, neatly, right? One divides into the other neatly. They so 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 it's already uh, already dividing into that one. So there we go. There's there's a technique, and it's very quick. You write down the first two numbers whose GCD you want to find. You cal calculate the remainder for dividing smaller by the bigger, and then you calculate the remainder for dividing the smaller by the bigger and so on and just keep going like that so you end up very quickly with the GCD. So far we've largely reviewed things you've already seen before so um, in our next lecture we're going to think about the extended Euclidean algorithm which will enable us to calculate the Bezu coefficients which may be something that's less familiar.